State of Nevada is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Gibbons presiding. Welcome back, everybody here for the second day. Our first case this morning is case number 75518, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department versus Las Vegas Review Journal. We have Ms. Nichols representing the appellant, Ms. McClatchy, and Mr. Tosca representing the respondents. Ms. Nichols, would you like to reserve any time in rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. Five minutes, please. You may do so. You may proceed. Good morning and thank you. Jackie Nichols on behalf of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. May it please the court. This case pertains to the 1 October incident and the various public records requests from the media in relation to that incident to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. In light of the numerous issues on appeal and cross appeal, I'd really like to jump into the heart of the department's appeal, which is the statutory interpretation of NRS 239.055, also known as the extraordinary use provision. Below, the district court found or interpreted the statute to exclude electronic records. And in this particular case, specifically the body worn camera footage and 911 calls from the extraordinary use provision. It's the department's position that nothing in that statute excludes electronic records from that interpretation. Counsel, I think there's a more fundamental question, which is what does it mean that the legislature repealed that statute? Sure. I don't believe that that affects this appeal or the department seeking to recover extraordinary use under NRS 239.055 because in looking at the Senate bill, I believe it was Senate bill 287, and I think it's section 13, it specifically provides that the amendments that take place based off of Senate bill 287 do not come into effect until October 1st, 2019. And in there, it specifically says that it applies to any cases filed after October 1st, 2019. Right. So it says that in section 11 of the bill about the amendatory provisions that they apply to all actions filed on or after October 1, 2019. And then after that, section 13 just says NRS 239.055 is hereby repealed. Is that an amendatory provision? I would argue that it is, that it is an amendment to the Public Records Act in its entirety. Senate bill 287 amended the Public Records Act, and that is an amendment to the Public Records Act is the repeal of NRS 239.055. Thank you. Sure. As far as the extraordinary use provision, I do think it's very important that the court recognize that the district court did specifically find in this case there was extraordinary use for both personnel and technological resources. And that issue is not on appeal. And that's a finding by the lower court. And in that respect, the issue then for this court is to determine whether or not electronic records, electronic data, such as body cam footage and 911 calls is subject to that extraordinary use provision. And in its order, the district court relied on the per page language in the first sentence of that provision. However, in reaching that decision, the court ignored, I believe it's the third sentence that reads, the fee charged by the government entity must be one, reasonable, and two, must be based on the cost the governmental entity actually incurs for extraordinary use of its personnel or technological resources. And I think that the term technological resources insinuates or implies that what we're talking about here also includes electronic records. There's nothing. I have a question on that. Sure. How do you, isn't it technological resources used to get, I mean, your reading is, seems a little bit creative because it seems they're pretty clear, you know, that it relates to documents. 
and the technological resources where we're talking about seems to be related to gathering those documents. Now, what I think I'm wrestling with is, you know, they just haven't, maybe the legislature hasn't caught up to the body cam. They haven't caught up to the electronic records thing to put a fee in there. I'm sure at some point they will, but they haven't yet. And so I'm trying to see how that is a gap you think that we can fill. Sure. And so if you look at the definition of technological resources in that section, it says it, it means any information, any information system or any information service acquired, developed, um, operated, maintained or otherwise used by the agency it, with respect to body cam footage. In this case, given the amount of redactions that were required and that's and that's really the heart of the extraordinary use of personnel and technological resources is that the redactions that were necessary to be performed on the body cam footage. So it's not necessarily the body cam footage alone or the 911 calls alone. It's the redactions which required a special system um, as indicated in Lieutenant Moon's declaration. Um, Let me ask you about that too. Because sure. Because they've uh, brought up that now they want your privilege, they want your logs to show what you've redacted because there's no way for them to know what you've redacted. Well, one, how I how is that going to come about? So, I don't think that that's properly before this court. Um, if they're challenging the redactions, I think that needs to be made at the lower court as far as the privilege. Well, I saw that on the cross appeal. One of the issues raised is that they re that uh, that they wanted to know what was redacted from that. And there's no way to know from what you gave them or from what you gave the general public. <coughs> I think that that's the argument that they've made on appeal, but there's nothing in the record that demonstrates that they made that to the lower court. And so I think it would be more proper for them to make that <coughs> argument to the lower court first and, and challenge the redactions being made. If you looked at the district court's um, disclosure order, which is the, that first order, um, it identifies what information can be redacted and it's personal identifying information. And that includes the identity of the individual and um, related information such as telephone numbers, um, addresses, and things of that nature. So if you're on body cam footage, what would happen, um, as described in Lieutenant Moon's is a declaration, is that you would have to have a redaction of, of the audio uh, of the of, I'm sorry, of the video, of the face of the individual, it would be blurred out. So it's not like a black screen, it, it's a blur. And then you would have the audio redaction of the person saying their first name, saying the address. And so it's not a, a complete blanket redaction. And so the argument that they aren't able to tell what is being redacted, um, I, I don't think it, it's, a, it, it's a fair characterization because it was never brought before the lower court. And so there's nothing in the record to reflect that they can't tell what has been redacted or what not, what has not been redacted. In terms of determining what's capable of redaction, should we be looking to the kind of more expansive view that if it's so unduly burdensome, burdensome that you got to come in and look at it as opposed to if it renders it meaningless? That is the department's position and, and there's really two Two authorities that support that. One is under the body cam statute, NRS 289.830, talks about making it available for inspection. And uh, inspection completely comports with the NPRA. It's not talking about withholding disclosure or access in its entirety. But isn't that more to withhold if it's uh, child porn? You know, if they open the door and they saw somebody being child trafficked, perhaps, that's not something they turn over to the press, the body cam footage. I mean, isn't that what they're talking about? What are you talking about that they'd have to go down there and inspect it as opposed to being produced? So if you look at the language of the statute, it says if it contains confidential information. So to me, there's a distinguishment between containing confidential information and the entire video being confidential. Um, if the entire video is confidential by a particular statute, let's talk about like a juvenile record, then no one would have access to that because uh, a particular statute renders it completely confidential. But if it contains confidential information, such as uh, personal identifying what information. Here, They've got body cam, they're rushing in, it's, everybody's getting shot. What are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, privacy interests as established under the CCSD versus Las Vegas Review Journal case. Um, we're talking about individuals' rights 
to not necessarily be associated with criminal investigations or um, victim rights. You have to also remember that a lot of these officers at, on 1 October were performing medical treatment via Turner kits. And so um, a lot of the body cam footage caught that on video. And so that is also a privacy interest that needs to be considered. Did you turn that over though in the end? Was that, was that part of what was turned over? That, that was footage? turned over in a redacted format. And so, so, so somebody went through and redacted all those portions of the videos? Yes, Your Honor. And this is why we're seeking at, um, extraordinary use <coughs> of personnel because, again, as dictated in Lieutenant Moon's declaration, that, again, at that point, that was just an estimate. Now that we have come full circle, the department spent over 9,000 hours and uh, a cost of nearly <coughs> $1 million dollars in getting detectives off of the street just to sit down and review this body cam footage. And so the process for, for reviewing and redacting this body cam footage includes reviewing it and marking what needs to be redacted and then it has to be redacted on a frame level. And so you're talking about an audio frame level and a video frame level. And that's where the majority of this work comes in. And then after that comes into play as a quality control review to make sure the redactions were proper on both ends, make sure we didn't over redact and make sure that um, the information that should be redacted is in fact redacted. And so that is the purpose of seeking the extraordinary cost under So if somebody's outside the Mandalay Bay and they're on the sidewalk, you're saying you're redacting, I mean, I don't know what was redacted, you're saying you're redacting their faces? So pursuant to the disclosure order and, and as reiterated in the transcript by Judge Scotty, what's being disclosed is if you can identify a specific individual. If you have groups of individual running, if, if you cannot tell who a person is, there was no redaction of that. It's the redaction of the individual. Um, if an officer is providing medical treatment and they're having that conversation with, with the individual, the victim. What statute or law says that's confidential? That was pursuant to the disclosure order. And again, that was prior to the Clark County School District uh, balancing test on uh, non-trivial privacy interests. But that was the argument that was raised below, is that these are privacy interests that are at stake here when you're talking about victims and witnesses and, and medical treatment being provided. Haven't the victims of October 1 been publicly identified already? The 58 victims, yes, but you ha you have to remember that individuals were also shot and, and medical treatment performed, right. and so I don't think that every single name of those individuals have been released. I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I don't know. Okay, Ms. Nichols, i got to ask you about mootness. Since you have uh, produced these uh, body cam, uh, since uh, sure. the order was entered, the court, I know, denied a stay on that. So <clears throat> now it's been produced. Uh, why should we address it in this case? Well, Your Honor, my first argument to that is, is Ms. McCletchie took the position in the response to our to the department's request for a stay that it would not be moot. And, and I quoted in my brief, I believe in my reply brief on page 11, that she attests, the undersigned attests, that there's still ongoing disputes over the Public Records Act in be between her client, the Review Journal, and Metro, and that... Uh, over body cam coverage or other issues? Uh, well, the, the way that the response reads is over <coughs> Public Records Act generally. As far as the, the body cam footage specifically, um, I do believe that the exception applies. NRS 289.830 is still intact. And in light of the Donray balancing test, which I would, I do believe um, would also apply, and the issue of inspection, um, I don't believe that, it, that it's moved and it is capable of, of evading review. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you want to reserve the I would like to, yes. We'll add uh, two minutes to your uh, time based on our questions and add two minutes to Ms. McClatchy's time. Thank Are you, you going to divide your uh, argument time? You, no, I, I'd like to save five minutes. Do you want me to divide my issues between well, the arguments? Oh, no, I'll, I'll just argue once and I am, Mr. Tosca has been 
generous enough, unless anybody has specific questions for him, to allow me to okay. make the argument. And you today. can reserve time for your cross appeal, so you're saying one of I'll, I'll reserve two minutes for issues on cross okay, appeal. Okay, very well. Go um, ahead and proceed. May it please the court, Maggie McCletchie for the Las Vegas Review Journal. Nobody questions law enforcement's important role in responding to 1 October. But the public and the media have a right to evaluate what occurred, including law enforcement's response. From ignoring the Review Journal's initial requests to engaging what the district court has found as gamesmanship after the disclosure order was entered, Metro has actually evidenced, un unfortunately, outright hostility towards the media's efforts to get access to records to help answer the public's questions about 1 October. That hostility, in my view, is in no small part reflected in their effort to get costs only from petitioners when they didn't even, other than an initial small batch of records, they didn't even directly produce records to us once after the disclosure order. It's our view that the appendix is properly before the court, primarily for the issues that we raise concerning mootness, because mootness issues can be addressed at any time. It is true, Ms. Nichols is correct, at the time of the briefing on the stay, the Review Journal did agree that this matter was capable of repetition, yet evading review, primarily regarding the extraordinary use statute, frankly, that was also an issue in the Henderson case. However, since that time, a number of things have occurred that have rendered Metro's issues largely moot, particularly its extraordinary use fee argument. First, its own actions. It failed to, to comply with the disclosure order that required them to produce the records to us. They also failed to comply with the cost order that required them as a condition, condition precedent to getting costs in the case to providing us with an advanced monthly estimate and proof of the, of the support for their 31 cents per page uh, cost for the actual cost statute. Um, they also mooted their appeal when they ignored the district court's disclosure order to meet and confer with us in good faith, with the utmost good faith concerning production issues. Instead, Metro took the position that the scope of the request could never be narrowed, that they couldn't work with us to figure out a reasonable and meaningful way to produce these records, when in fact we of course could have jointly worked to amend the order. Uh, but they, they refused to work with us, instead taking the position they didn't have to follow the orders, they didn't have to produce the records to us, and they instead engaged in their catacall mass production, which by the way, they never communicated uh, with us directly about. My client happened to get a mass email about. Ms. Um, McClutchy, so did they ever provide to you your requested footage directly to you? Like, Absolutely. here's your request, here's your response. The initial batch of records mm -hmm. we were told would be available for us for pickup for no cost at Metro's headquarters. <laughs> we went and got those. And other than that, no communication to us was made about those records. Instead, there were weekly emails that went out to an email list that I don't believe every single petitioner was on. There's obviously a number of media petitioners. So no, other than the first batch of records, they did not produce records directly to us. It actually posed logistical challenges uh, for us when, when there was an erroneous failure of us to drop off a disk and we had to run around and get copies from the other petitioners. So no, the, direct, the records have not been produced directly to us. They haven't been communicated between, about between council and I don't think it was good faith. But something else happened too since, uh, since we said that this wasn't moved. SB 287 was passed, and that repealed the extraordinary use statute. With regard to Justice Kadish's questions, questions about whether whether or not uh, that was uh, when whether or not that still applies, it's my view that it doesn't because of the separate way in Section 12 and 11. They talk about a mandatory provisions are effective as of October 1st, and then they say that the extraordinary use provision .005 is repealed. I don't. Think it's in effect. I don't think that they can. They can. They have the authority. As the bill is. It's not in effect, and it doesn't affect this case okay. because SB 270, SB 287 <laughs> repealed it, Justice Kadish, and because in the sec they make a they clarify about when the amendatory provisions are going to go into effect, but they specifically have a separate section that say it's hereby repealed. It's done. It's gone. It's off the books. Moreover in light of our argument that they can't charge us for records, that they wouldn't even produce records to us, it's it's absolutely moot and it's not capable of repetition, yet, a, yet evading review. Finally, this court, 
uh, decided the Las Vegas Review, Review Journal v. Henderson case. In that case, I contended that issues, in, issues concerning, our issues concerning the extraordinary use statute were capable of repetition yet evading review, even though uh, the, the Henderson had given us the records for no, no fee. And this court disagreed with me and held that there has to be a live controversy that because we had the records and they hadn't charged us the fee, that it was moot. So just like in that case, this, their claim for extraordinary use statutes, uh, for extraordinary use fees are moot. But uh, if this court does consider their arguments, it's important to point out, I think, that either that neither the actual cost statute or the extraordinary use statute allow for compensation for overhead. The government is not entitled to use it to obtain a windfall and get compensated for costs it incurs, it incurs regardless of whether a specific request for records is, is made. This reflects the central premise that facilitating access to public records is a public function and that responding to requests is, is a part have to be per page. It says that right in there. It says 50 cents per page is the limit. And when you look at the legislative history that I don't think you need to get to, but when you look at the legislative history of bills like SB 74, it's explicitly clear that the goal was reducing cost to request requesters and ensuring that we don't have a situation like this one where exorbitant costs are put up as a roadblock to access. Um, in addition to, to the fact that it has to be a per page cost and it can't be more than 50 cents, it also has to be reasonable under the repealed extraordinary use statute and it has to be, uh, must be based on the cost that the government entity actually incurs for the extraordinary use. The, uh, the Council for Metro tries to make much ado of that and say, well, that's different from the actual use prohibition, actual cost definition for the actual cost statute, which says actual cost means the direct cost related, and it does not include a cost that a government entity incurs regardless of whether or not a person requests a cost of a particular record. While the phrase actual cost is, was not literally used in the extraordinary use statute, it still says it has to be based on the cost that the government entity incurs for the extraordinary use. That, by definition, can't be overhead. And in this case, uh, there has been no evidence that anything other than overhead uh, is, is being attempted to be charged. This is also consistent with the NPRA's mandate, reflecting that access to public records is an important public policy, and that mandating that restrictions, including cost provisions, be read narrowly, and that access to records is a part of an agency's job. Again, I think the legislative history is absolutely relevant, but when you get there, it actually supports the Las Vegas Review Journal's position. Um, and that's because when uh, they first enacted these provisions, for example, uh, he uh, Heller, who was at that point on the records committee that had drafted the language, said, and this is at A1032 through 1140, that he wanted to put the intent on the record that cost should never be used as a means of deterring public access to information about the conduct and activities of government. Uh, when we get to SB 123, they make much of a, much ado about Senator Kerr's back and forth with a lobbyist from UMC. In fact, uh, Kerr, the whole impetus for the changes in SB 123 that didn't actually pertain to the cost provisions, but instituted the preamble and the five-day uh, response requirements. In fact, what you see in, in Senator Kerr's testimony is that he's trying to, he was concerned about articles about uh, government agency responses, and he was asking UMC whatever happened with a request for, for, check for, for a check for staff time. He wasn't saying, oh, that's a good idea for you to charge for staff time. In fact, he says, uh, if an office gets a request for documents and there's time for staff to retrieve and copy the documents, it would not be the most important function the office serves, but those people would work for taxpayers at that time by satisfying a taxpayer's request for public records. Overhead costs would have to be eaten as a matter of public policy. <clears throat> Similarly, Senator Segerblum's uh, discussion regarding the postage is, is somewhat confusing, I will concede, but I do think at best it says that they can charge for postage. There's no evidence that his testimony stands for the proposition that you can charge an hourly rate or uh, or for electronic records. In fact, when you go through the history of SB 74, again, there's numerous occasions in the committee hearings where they say that the goal of the bill was to reduce costs and to get, get government agencies 
on board with providing electronic records instead of hard copy records because there should be no cost with electronic records. That's what the legislature said. Um, with regard to um, this idea that they aired, that the court aired in uh, requiring us to pay over a six month period and not all up front, it's obviously moot, but there's nothing in the NPRA that actually would have required us to pay up front. Instead, they were supposed to give us the, the estimates up, up front, which they never did. Um, if this court were to agree with them that we are required to uh, pay any, any costs, uh, actual costs or extraordinary use costs, I think at this point you would need to remand. Um, and that's because there's no evidence right now that they ever provided <laughs> records to us. I, I don't think that you should remand. Instead, I think you should find that they waived the issue and it's therefore moot. But um, Metro made clear they received multiple requests for this information, and so they decided to do this cattle call. We weren't the only, uh, the petitioners in this case, the Review Journal and the other petitioners, weren't the only ones asking for this information, and it would be absolutely both illegal and unjust to require us to pay. I also think it would constitute First Amendment retaliation because would they say, well, the only, what's different about you is that you went to court to get the access, and they argue that the extraordinary use fee, fee statute does allow them to provide, to only charge the very first requester and not the other requesters. Even if that interpretation of the extraordinary use statute is correct, the problem with that, they never even established who the very first requester is. And obviously I think it would be an unjust and unfair result for the people who went to court to fight to get access to these records, to get information to the public, to be on the hook um, at this point, frankly, it would also violate our due process rights because we have never been given the cost estimate. In the extraordinary use statute and in the court's order, there's the idea that you provide an estimate ahead of time. That's so that you don't have to pay a half a million dollars or a million dollars. So, M Ms. McClutchy, I'm sorry to interrupt, <laughs> no. but I want to understand, with the whatever they did disclose generally to the media of the body cam footage, is there still a remaining dispute, in other words, more footage, more documents that you haven't received that you're still trying to receive? And I guess related to that, um, with regard to their redactions, whether you um, asked for a privilege log. Apparently that's in dispute. Um, we did ask for a privilege log, and I apologize, excuse me. In our, in our reply brief on our cross appeal, we did point out um, in, in the record where we had asked for a privilege log. It is true that initially in our opening in our opening brief in support of our petition, we weren't seeking a privilege log. We were seeking access to the records, and so. Uh, but we did we did thereafter um, uh, we did thereafter um, address the the fact that we wanted a privilege log both in briefs and in uh, and in oral argument. And that's on pages. 14 through 16 of our reply and cross appeal. Uh, so we, we did raise that issue. Um, with regard to the, the issues concerning. May I ask, when was that done? Sure. The district court judge. They're saying that you waived it somehow below. Where is that in the record in the district court that you. That we raised the issue? Yeah. Of the privilege. Oh, okay. Those those sites are in those pages that I indicated, but I will. Um, oh, okay. So it's in your reply brief. It's in our reply time. brief. So we said. Um, in its reply in support of the amended petition, the Review Journal asserted Metro should be required to produce a privilege law, not just to withheld documents, but also redacted documents. That, that's at 2AA247. Um, we, we reiterated the assertion that they should have redacted records as necessary and should have explained in a privilege law what it was redacting and why. That's at 2AA251. And there are a few other, a few other sites as well on pages 14 through 15 of our reply brief across the field. Thank you. <coughs> so Ms. there's, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. I just wanted to clarify then, there's still at issue some, some video that hasn't been provided, I guess because of redactions that you're trying to get or at least get a privilege log. The video has been, it's my understanding, although they've refused to give us a certification about whether or not all the records have produ been produced, and they've taken a position that not a single list of these records exists. So it's hard for us to discern from our position whether or not the documents have ever actually all been provided. They they have said in court in district court that they have, um, but uh, they have been produced with redactions. And it's our view that 
the, the failure to require the privilege law combined with the district court's sort of nebulous uh, order regarding, um, regarding redactions for things like descriptors of individuals and social media of individuals, it is our view that, uh, that, that there are still issues concerning what exactly was redacted and why. Um, and uh, with regard to waiver, I will point out that this case is different from the Henderson case. In that case, this court found, uh, found that my arguments that a government entity had waived were, my, the, the court rejected my arguments. But part of the reason the court did that, or the reason the court did that, is because in that case, Henderson did respond within five days. It didn't provide the specific bases for withholding records, but it did say, uh, we're gonna provide you records on date X. And this court, Frank, basically found that it would be too burdensome to require that at that time to provide a complete privilege log. But to be asserting, clear, yes. is it your position that you have not received all of the body cam footage, leaving aside other documents and information? It's my position that I don't know, but that it's my understanding that Metro's Council has represented that we have, in fact, received all the body cam footage. However, there have been redactions. Right, and you could go review the films and see the redactions yourself, could you not? Um, I actually offered to, they, they have not told us that we could go inspect any of the specific records. They actually rejected that, although the district court order did provide that if they wanted to, withhold, if it was impossible to redact body cam footage or too difficult, they could have provided by inspection. They decided that wasn't a feasible, uh, a feasible way of handling the production because of out-of-state media, the number of people who wanted access to these records. And, and did the review journal request the body cam footage? We did. We did. We we did. We joined. There's numerous places okay. where we jo we did specifically join. It was a consolidated action, and we did join with the other petitioners in requesting the body cam footage. And we made that clear uh, on the record and in briefs. And they never raised that issue. They never raised that issue in district court. But I think in this case, uh, it's it's unlike Hender it's unlike the Henderson case because they didn't respond at all within the five day deadline. And we're not suggesting they should have provided a privilege log. But requesters do have some right to know why why records are being withheld. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Nichols. Thank you. Um, I'd like to touch on a brief point that Ms. McClutchy pointed out. Um, the idea that the department violated the disclosure order. First, there's nothing in the record that reflects that. There's no order from the court determining that the department did not comply with a disclosure order. What happened was that the media, litigate, media litigants wanted exclusive access to these records. And what they failed to recognize is, in addition to their public records requests, there were hundreds of other public records requests submitted to the department in relation to 1 October. And under its, on, under its obligation, um, under the NPRA, specifically 239.0107, if we have records that are now readily available, we are under an obligation to provide those. So as we are redacting body cam footage and making it available, if we receive subsequent requests, we have to make that available. If not, then the department will be subject to litigation. So why are these the only ones you're charging? If you had hundreds of public records requests, as you just said, so you had to produce them to everyone, why are these the only ones you're imposing If you expenses look at on? the statutory provision of NRS 239.055, the very last sentence says, the government entity shall not charge such a fee if the government entity is not required to make extraordinary use of personnel or technological resources to fulfill additional requests for the same information. And so, the first request that comes in, if that is what we're obligated to do after the now um, Judge Scotty's disclosure order, the sub subsequent request, we are not entitled to charge. I have, I have a question, and that's on the body cam again. Going back to inspection, where in the record can we find that you uh, had allowed them to go inspect the body cam records? Where in the record would we find that? Because under the statute, you're saying that they could have walked, you know, walked down there, walked in, inspected these body right. cam footage. Where in the record do we see that you've made this uh, offer to them and that they refused it or whatever? 
Well, the, our, the department's position is the court ordered production. And so they could have went down and inspected, and they didn't. They wanted production of the actual record. She's saying that, um, is it, am I incorrect? Did I not just hear she offered to come down and, and, and see these records? Maybe I misunderstood her argument. She attempted, what the attempt was, and I believe this, it's the email chains back and forth in the respondent's uh, appendix, and I believe it's like 1 through 80. I don't know the, the particular site. Um, but there is an exchange regarding inspection versus production, and we did try to accommodate regarding inspection in those cases, but they would not do inspection in lieu of production is the problem. There was no attempt to modify the order. There was no attempt to enter into a stipulation and order regarding inspection in lieu of production. So if, kind of following up on what I asked your opposing colleague, um, if they get the body cam footage and their redactions and they don't have a privilege log and they say, hey, we want to go look at the video intact, to be clear, you would allow that or not? I, the department would allow that. And where on the record is that supported, or did that this dispute not reach that point in the district court? This that dispute did not reach it in the district court because the district court specifically ordered production and not inspection. But you did. Does the record support that you stood by your offer to allow inspection, or did you withdraw that once you were ordered to produce? It was never withdrawn. It was we we would have liked to provided inspection in lieu of production. And so that's indicated in the email chains. Um, and it's in the respondent's appendix um, filed by Ms. McCutcheon. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Nichols, I have one last question before you go. Uh, you're talking about the redactions you made. Were the redactions done by blurring or were they done by cuts in the, uh, in the body cam footage? Uh, in the body cam footage, it was blurring of individuals. So the actual video was blurring. And then when it came to audio, it would be like a blank. So if an individual is speaking, saying my name is, then you would have a blank. And then the uh, just for the purposes of the name of the individual or whatever personal identifying information that is being spoken. Um, and then the audio would continue. So the videos have not been cut in any way. They Absolutely are, they're not. They're blurring, but no cuts. The audio is has been removed then through, uh, uh, through that process. Then, That's correct. correct. Okay. Thank Chief, you very much. Chief, can I ask a question? Of course. Justice Stiglitz has a question. Uh, so, Ms. Nichols, who was the LVRJ the first requester or the only requester to challenge it in court? Who, who was the first requester? So who should pay? I don't have that information as far as who is the first requester. What I can tell you that is provided in the record that the Review Journal made a request on October 2nd, less than 12 hours after the incident. Um, whether or not that is the first request, I, I don't have the knowledge to tell you that right now. But all requests being equal, so if everybody requests or 10 people request it, how do you determine who pays for it? I mean, I assume it, you told everybody no. Right? That, you that said, is no, correct, no, 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 no. Our, our argument was that, that it was subject to a criminal investigation. And so the approach that we took in this case is what media agencies required us to produce the records. And in this case, it would be the uh, respondents. Okay. Okay, so let me get that straight because I think I'll, I'll ask and Justice Harris says a question too. So you, you're not 100% sure the RFJ was the first requester, but they were the first requester that certainly went to court and to, uh, to force the issue, so to speak, that line. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Justice Harris, Chief. Well, uh, that leads to the, the question you cited 005 for the proposition that you can't charge additional requesters. Uh, that implicit in that statute and in that argument, it seems to me, is the requirement that the government identify who the first requester is, whether that request is in court or whether that request is simply the request that you've received. Uh, since you don't know that, 
that point along with a number of other issues here seems to raise the question in my mind about whether this whole appeal and this debate about costs is totally premature uh, do you agree with your opponent that you have not responded in court to the requests made beyond the records they initially received do you agree with that we I no, I don't agree with that because we did provide them with all the records. All the records in relation to 1 October have been produced. Well, Ms. And they McClatchy. have been provided to, to the respondents. Well, Ms. McClatchy indicated during her argument that she received an initial set of records but had not received a response to her request after that. Did you hear that portion of her argument? I, I did not. A, a response to her request in, in relation to, I guess... Her client's request. Into public records. Yeah. No. Everything... They have received everything. So my understanding of Ms. McCletchie's argument was that um, the, the issue dealt with counsel for the department, which would be myself and Mr. Crosby, not providing her and Mr. Tasca with the records. Rather than incurring additional attorney's fees and costs in this litigation, which is a whole separate issue, my client preferred to produce the document straight to the media agencies. That's what happened. That's how I understood Ms. McCletchie's argument. Well, I'll ask her to clarify that, but it seems to me that if there's a if there are open issues in this case about whether the redaction was appropriate, uh, if there are open issues in this case about whether or not records have been produced, if there are open issues in this case about the extent and appropriateness of the disclosure order, I don't understand why we're arguing about people's costs when none of those issues seem to be resolved. They seem to be open. Well, and I would point this court to the Register of Actions where there has not been a single filing with the lower court regarding all of those issues. So why those issues are being presented to you orally today, nothing in the district court reflects that those issues have been brought to the attention of the lower court. Well, I understand that, but there is an intervening problem that uh, I don't think has been adequately uh, briefed or addressed. And it's not I'm not criticizing you lawyers because this came up as a result of the legislature's action. But as Justice Kadish has pointed out, uh, and, the, and, and in fairness to the lawyers, the legislature does tricky things with its effective dates on its statutes. I'm sure you would agree. So sometimes it says, as it did in this case, the provisions in this statute are uh, effective for cases filed on or after October 1. But then it inserts Section 13, and it says this statute, the one we're debating, is repealed. What's unclear and what hasn't been briefed is, is that retroactive? What's the, the, the legal question, which I think is unresolved, is what is the effect of the legislature's declaration that a statute is repealed. Is it retroactive? Is it repealed effective on the date that it has been passed? Usually it says, the legislature says, effective upon passage and approval. Didn't even say that here. So I think it's entirely unclear whether uh, that statute is retroactive for all time, from the time it was originally enacted forward, uh, or simply going forward. I think that's really uh, unclear. And it makes a difference with respect to the arguments you folks are making about uh, mootness. I think maybe uh, we need some more briefing on this subject, just speaking for myself, because I'm not clear about that either. Okay, thank you, Ms. Nichols. Thank you. Ms. McClatchy, would you, would you want to uh, answer Justice Hardesty's question? Could you clarify what you said about what's been produced? I'm, I'm not... And, and you tend to speak quickly. I'd like you to go a little slower for me, if you could. Yeah. I understand. Thank you, Justice, and I apologize. So the records, Metro has represented, they've produced all the records. However, the way that they produced the records were these sort of cattle call 
productions where you'd have to keep your eye out for these alert emails, uh, buy an unopened disc, drop it off at Metro at a certain time, and then go back and pick up your disc. But that was not a production to petitioners. That was an at-large open kind of cattle call process where we would rush to make sure that we complied with it so that we would get the records at the same time as everybody else. Could you address uh, this uh, 005 argument? Uh, was there ever a debate or a question raised about uh, the sequence of the requesters and who bears the cost depending upon what order and those uh, requests have been made? So the position in the, the position in the dis district court that we took and the other petitioners took was that they weren't entitled to the extraordinary use fees. Um, however, and the court generally agreed with us with some small exceptions. However, uh, I will point out that it's Metro's position on, uh, I think, page 8 of their opening brief. Um, oh, I'm sorry, page 11 of their opening brief, that we never actually requested the body worn camera, but that we joined through the litigation and the request for the other petitioners. So there was nev they've never established who was the first requester. Well, I saw that, and this is why I was concerned about the issue, because if, in fact, uh, their position is that you were a joiner, that implies that somebody was ahead of you. And based on the argument that Ms. Nichols made a few minutes ago about 005, you wouldn't seem to be liable for those costs whatsoever. Whoever that was first in line would have this issue. Understood, but here's why I think it's moot. They didn't produce the records based on who made the first request. They didn't They didn't produce the records yeah. first to the first requester. Instead, they did this cattle call production. But that takes me full circle to my question. It seems like all of this debate about the cost that they seek uh, is really not adequately developed in the district court. I, I think the issue instead, Your, Your Honor, is that the that it's moot, that the, they've decided to not comply with the orders. The records are already out of the bag. Why, why fight now about who the first person was? We can't go in time and have the figure this, this out at this mm -hmm. stage because they decided in their own in their own, on their own terms to produce these records in response to all the requests through a different process than the one the district Well, it does ordered. seem like these issues, sort of like the HOA cases, this stuff is evolving uh, rather than people identifying uh, early on in the case what your positions are going to be. I, I will say this with regard to the redactions. We couldn't have gotten any further clarity from the district court because uh, the district court didn't require that they explain their redactions and gave a, a sort of general basis for uh, what kind of redactions they should make. Um, with regard to um, the one issue on my uh, cross appeal that I didn't have a chance to discuss is the the GIS systems. Again, they've produced all the records to everybody, so I think that the questions about who should pay for the GIS systems and we never got the cost estimate are moot, but they claim that the district court had said that we are they, they can charge us extraordinary use fees, uh, i.e. pre-copy pre preparation costs up to 50 cents a page for items printed out from the GIS system. Um, in fact, uh, that statute, I will concede, is different from the other cost statute and is a little broader than the other cost statutes about but what... Ms. McCush, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut you Understood. off because the time did expire out of fairness to each side. Yeah, I understand. Thank and you. Kind of, we kind of went off the rails on the time <laughs> and all these <laughs> questions answered. But thank, thank you, you very much. for uh, indulging the court's questions. And thank you for the excellent arguments and briefs in this case from both sides. And we will take this case under submission. We'll be in recess to the next call of the court.